All right, welcome again, everyone. So this is a topic, or the topic I should say of today's talk is astrology and self-development. This, to uh, this talk is going to, um, has three basic uh, or three components. Uh, the first, the introduction is just gonna cover some basic definitions, uh, some disclaimers and a very brief history of astrology. Uh, the main uh, section of the presentation is going to cover some fundamental or core concepts that are very important to understand as they are sort of the building blocks um, uh, of astrology. Those include number and what are called qualities that inform astrological concepts like the zodiac or the planets. I um, mean, when I refer to planets in this talk, it's going to be the astrological planets, which are the two luminaries, the sun and moon and the five starry planets, the five visible planets, the seven bodies. Um, and then last, lastly, we're going to cover um, how these concepts um, can impact uh, possibilities for self-development. So the first thing we're going to do is look at this quote from the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Kant said, and this is written on his tombstone uh, in, in, I think, Koenigsberg, um, two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe, the more often and steadily we reflect upon them the starry heavens above me, and the moral law within me. So I chose this quote uh, to, to begin the presentation for two reasons. One, um, which is a little more obvious, Kant uh, is explicitly calling to our attention um, the two main components uh, of what this talk will be about, the, the relationship between the subjective and the objective, between mind and matter. Um, the second reason I chose this was because Kant stands at uh, a unique um, place in history as the first uh, Western philosopher to really understand, in my opinion, the ramifications of what had happened over the preceding 150 years, uh, which included um, the age of rationalism, the scientific revolution, uh, the age of reason. Um, and so Kant really sort of stands looking back uh, and, and understanding how this was going to really um, affect and change the world, what this new, what was called at the time, the new science, how that was going to change everything. And a main reason I wanted to give this talk was to give, um, give an understanding of what that world looked like, which included uh, sort of the astrological concept or paradigm before the scientific revolution. Um, we live certainly in, in a very different time now. Um, I believe that there are aspects or components of that worldview um, that are that are valuable to us as human beings. So this is a generic definition from the internet, from Oxford Languages. If you Google astrology, this is the definition that you get. The study of the movements and relative positions of celestial bodies interpreted as having an influence on human affairs in the natural world. And that is, I think, pretty accurate. Uh, it's a little uh, vague. Um, I'd like to give a more specific definition that I wrote um, that to me, astrology is a language-based art form used to interpret cycles, these are cycles of light via the planets, which disclose aspects of an underlying symbolic order or truth that can be objectively observed and, where applicable, subjectively experienced. And I say where applicable because um, that would only pertain to um, looking at uh, astrological charts or horoscopes of people who can have subjective experiences. These are some disclaimers I'd like to, to, um, to discuss very briefly. Um, astrology is a vast subject. It's not monolithic. Um, uh, what I'm presenting here is just my take on something that's extremely complex and, and has many, uh, goes back a long time. Uh, and there are many astrologies. Um, I'm going to talk about Western astrology, which is an astrology that developed out of uh, Mesopotamian Egypt and was uh, synthesized um, uh, in the Greek culture of the Hellenistic period um, centered in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, there are certainly other astrologies, um, Chinese astrology, Indian astrology, Mesoamerica astro Mesoamerican astrology. Um, and I, in no means by presenting uh, this lecture, am I meaning to imply that what I'm presenting is astrology? That's absolutely not necessarily the case. Astrology is not fortune telling. Um, astrology is not even a belief system. Um, I consider astrology to be what I would call a heuristic device. Um, by that, I mean it's an approach to problem solving or self-discovery. Um, when you think about believing in astrology, for me, that's like, do you believe in economics or do you believe in psychology? Um, those are ways of looking at things. Um, uh, and I believe astrology can be is similar to a social science in that respect. 
The astrology we're going to look at uh, is tropical. By that, the zodiac is um, tied to the to the seasons, which we're going to get into. It's phenomenological. By that, I mean that it's rooted in the lived experience of human beings, and it's geocentric. And so, astrology is taken from the perspective of a specific time and location and space. What that means is, if humans colonized Mars and we were living on Mars, would we cast charts from the perspective of Mars? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Um, also, there's a, oftentimes a misunderstanding of divination um, in the ancient world um, that divination was was telling someone about the future, and that's not what divination really was. Divination were was trying to get information about what to do in the here and the now in order to create balance and harmony between um, you know the divine or gods and uh, humans. Um, also, astrology is like flying an airplane. There's a lot of astrological information uh, out there, especially on the internet. And um, learning a little bit um, is like flying an airplane, and then you're in the airplane and you realize you don't know how to land the plane. Um, astrology does have the potential to be uh, counterproductive, if not potentially destructive, um, when, if not sort of understood in uh, the proper context. That takes a long time, uh, in my opinion, to learn. Um, but I just want to throw that out that um, that that there is uh, it is uh, it is a powerful technology in my opinion, and uh, I certainly encourage everyone to look into it. That's why I'm doing this talk. But um, just wanted to state that as well. So this is a very broad brushed um, look at Western horoscopic astrology. I wish I could spend a lot of time talking about this in greater detail. Um, but what I will say is three things. One. Uh, from the first century BCE uh, up until the mid 17th century, astrology was theoretically, um, despite the fact that it went through uh, several very different cultures, um, was theoretically consistent for the most part. Um, in the 19th and 18th and 19th century, astrology um, lost its institutional support, meaning it stopped ceased being taught at uh, universities uh, in Europe and pretty much almost uh, died. When it was resurrected in the late 19th century uh, in England, and then later in the United States, um, it came back uh, in a very different form than what had the 18th centuries between the first century BCE and the 17th century um, in three ways. One, it was greatly simplified. Um, that's where we get this idea of sun signs and that kind of stuff. Um, that's an outgrowth or, or modern take on, on things. Uh, the second uh, difference was that it became very character characterological or, or focused on character or personality, more subjectively oriented. And lastly, um, it appropriated the language of two things, one, psychology, and uh, two, uh, the theosophical movement, which was the forerunner uh, of what is now commonly referred to as the New Age movement. And that's where some of the ideas that people involved in theosophy got from uh, the East, including karma and reincarnation, and a lot of those ideas made their way into astrology. So astrology never recovered from um, its uh, being sort of laughed out of existence um, in the 17th century. Uh, this is a copy of a book I have. It's probably the longest book I have. It's 1,200 pages, Columbia History of the World. Um, there's not one sentence in this book about astrology, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, by the first century BCE, take, having taken ideas from Mesopotamia and Egypt, um, uh, a, a synthesis was, was formed. Um, it was a system that is still the main system of astrology, which considers of a fourfold, a fourfold system uh, that take that's planets, signs, houses, and aspects. In this talk, we're gonna we're gonna go over planets and signs very, very briefly. We won't really have any time to even touch on houses or aspects. Um, and there were three main uh, uses of astrology. One was natal astrology or doing charts for things that are born like humans. Uh, you could do, of course, a natal chart for a chicken or a dog or anything else that has a beginning. Electional charts, which was the timing, a propitious timing for things like getting married or starting a business and mundane astrology, which was the study of uh, weather and natural events uh, and politics or the fate of nations, those kind of things. The fourth branch of astrology did not come into being until the medieval period. Um, uh, during the Islamic Golden Age, uh, which is called horary astrology. These are the modern names for these, uh, which has to do with casting a chart uh, when a question is asked and deriving an answer to that question from the chart. Uh, this is an actual horoscope um, from the first century BCE where the, the positions of the planets are, are written. 
So we're going to get into now a topic for several slides that have that is a foundational uh, um, system that underlies many of the concepts that are involved in astrology. Um, a lot of these ideas can be traced to the sixth century BC uh, BCE um, I, um, Ionian philosopher uh, who lived in in Italy, um, Pythagoras. We're going to look at the numbers one, two, three, and four, which according to this type of thinking, um, were foundational in that they, if you add up one, two, three, and four, you get 10. 10 was thought to be a number related to completion. So the greatest Neo-Pythagorean uh, was a person named Plato, um, Alfred North Whitehead, the 20th century mathematician and philosopher said all of Western philosophy uh, can be considered footnotes to Plato. Um, Plato says here in the Republic, the knowledge of which geometry aims is the knowledge of the eternal. Then my noble friend, geometry will draw the soul towards truth and create the spirit of philosophy and raise up that which is not unhappily allowed to fall down. So these ideas that he's talking about of the eternal versus the uh, the sensible, um, rising up towards truth, falling, um, these are some of the things that we're going to see moving forward. So we're going to begin with the number one. The number one in this type of thinking, which is a sort of a mystical way of, of looking at uh, numbers, uh, one has to do with identity. And that's because one is the number that holds the principle that exists in all other numbers. So one is contained in, in all other numbers. One was considered to be both even and odd. And we'll see why what even and odd mean in the next few slides. Uh, that was because if you added one to an even number, you'd get an odd number. And if you added one to an odd number, you'd get an even number. One contains within it the beginning, middle, and end. Uh, one was ultimate. It was indivisible. It was the artificer and modeler. Uh, one could be conceived of as being itself, uh, the word uh, logos. And one was um, could be conveyed as, as a dot or a point in space uh, or um, a circle. Um, this is a quote from a Neoplatonic philosopher from the fourth century uh, CE, Iamblichus, who said, one never outruns or departs from its own principle, nor allows anyone else to do so, since it shares out its own properties, father and mother, matter and form, craftsman and what is crafted. It is intellect, moral wisdom, being cause of truth, simple paradigm and order. So now what does that have to do with astrology? Well, it has a lot to do in the sense that in the in an astrological worldview before the Enlightenment, or before the scientific revolution, this is a, uh, the way that the, the universe was conceived. And the word universe literally means one turning. And so what's important um, in this slide that I'm trying to convey are two things. One, that the universe was conceived of as a closed system. On the outer ring of this um, were the, the stars, or what were called the fixed stars, which was a sphere um, that was closer to um, the divinity and was less changing, was more permanent, more immutable. Um, in our world, which was the sublunary world uh, on Earth, was where the four elements uh, interacted. It was it's a place of generation and corruption, or where things are born and die uh, in constant change. And in between those two places were the spheres of the planets. Planet means wanderer. And these planets were moving around, um, sort of mediating between um, a more divine reality uh, in our world of incessant change. Not only was this a closed system, but the word cosmos means order. It was there was an order to the system. Um, cosmos means good order of, of the system, of the world. What modern people have, one reason I think that many modern people cannot understand astrology is because unless you are looking at it this way, astrology does not make any sense. So this is a very important um, principle. So now moving to the number two, here we go from a, a point to a line. Um, the number two signifies movement and change. Uh, it's the first even number. And as we'll see, even numbers have to do with materiality uh, and matter. Um, two uh, involves polarity or separation, uh, courage, daring impulse, you're dividing the circle in half, um, has to do with opinion and division. Uh, the number two is thought to be subordinate to the monad, to number one, as matter is subordinate to form. Uh, Carl Jung, looking back on another uh, somewhat contemporary of um, Pythagoras, uh, Heraclitus, he's saying, old Heraclitus, who is indeed a very great sage, discovered the most marvelous of all psychological laws, the regulative function of opposites. He called it 
and antiadromia are running contrawise, by which he meant that sooner or later, everything runs into its opposite. And this idea of opposites is absolutely critical and crucial to understanding astrological symbolism. It is impossible, in my opinion, to make sense of without really understanding um, how things were conceived in terms of opposites. Now, moving on to a maybe even more interesting number three, the triad or triangle. Three has to do with spirit or active principle. Um, this spirit, the number three is a combination of one and two. So being and form create spirit. Um, it's the first odd number. Um, three represents the creative pattern that animates um, life. And that word pattern is related to, in Latin or Greek, the word pater, uh, or in English, the word father. This is a associated, this principle is associated as all odd numbers are um, with a uh, masculine energy. Um, this had to do with perfection and proportionality, friendship and peace, uh, harmony and unification. Um, in Neoplatonism, this was this trinity is the is the one intellect and soul. Uh, in Christianity, it's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, and again, getting back to uh, beginning, middle, and end. In contrast to three stands four. Um, when we talk about like the building blocks of something, that's what we're talking or evoking um, that symbol uh, related to four, uh, which is symbolized by the square and has to do with matter or form. So just like pattern is where we get father from, matter is related to um, mother um, and materiality. Um, it's an even number. It's, it's perhaps even more even than two. It's two plus two or two times two. Um, it has to do with materiality, substance, and expression. Uh, from this, we get ideas like the four winds, the four directions, and also orientating ourselves in space, up, down, left, right, uh, north, south, east, and west. So this is a symbol. This is a Celtic cross. This is, when I see this symbol, I always think, okay, there's one in four. So you're seeing identity or being as symbolized by the circle superimposed um, in on the, the, the cross, which is um, has to do with four and matter. Uh, another interesting use of four was the quadrivium, which we're just thinking about and what we're looking at um, right now, understanding number, uh, the study of arithmetic, which is the study of number, the study of music, which is number and time, geometry, which is number and space, and astronomy, of which astrology was a part, is number in space and time. So in conclusion, looking at this list uh, here on the left, this is from Aristotle, but he's taking it from uh, Pythagoras. Um, looking at these two principles, which I would summarize as even and odd numbers, is extremely important uh, from a foundational conceptual perspective related to astrology and astro astrological symbolism. It is involved in the planets, it's involved in the houses, and it's involved in the aspects. Um, this comes from number theory, uh, which is the main point I'd like to make. Now, when you look at good and bad, why is one good? Why is one bad? It's because if you look on the right and you see what they're, this is a way that the Greeks would have actually conceived of numbers, which would be uh, more spatial like this. When you look at the odd numbers, which is listed here as a masculine number, you're seeing that it's making a perfect square that is only changeable in size. It's, it's a set of numbers that are tending towards unity. So if you add up the odd numbers, one plus three, you get four. If you add up one plus three plus five, you get nine. If you add up one plus three plus five plus seven, you get 16. They're all perfect squares. Whereas if you add up the odd numbers on the right, you get an infinite multitude of different rectangles. So one is orienting towards unity. The other is orienting towards multiplicity. And in that context, they're saying this one is good, this one is bad. So another important foursome are the four qualities. Um, two of the qualities are wet and dry, and the other two are hot and cold. And we're, we're going to start with um, hot and cold, which were considered active qualities. By active, these have to do with levels of energy. Things that are hot are thought to be active, dynamic, and expansive, and things that had the cold property were at rest, contract, uh, static, or heavy. There were also passive qualities, which had to do, which were called wet or moist and dry. These were qualities of form. Um, things that were wet were thought to be adaptive, plastic, soft, and smooth. Things that were dry were thought to be rigid, hard, and rough. Uh, wet things tend to bring things together. Um, so when you think of the moon astrologically, it's a very wet planet, um, whereas things that are dry tend to separate 
um, separate things. So this is sort of a, um, a rudimentary chemistry, I guess. Um, now, Aristotle, some Aristotle conceived of the idea that our world is in flux of things moving from the hot to the dry, the dry to the cold, the cold to the wet, and the wet to the hot. That is where the four elements fit into, um, which existed uh, before Aristotle, of course, but he was the one to think of the world as they were changing from one uh, to the other. Uh, prior to in the pre-Socratic uh, philosophers, you know, one thought that everything was fire, one thought everything was air, one thought everything was water. Um, and this is, so each of the four elements, which are the building blocks of, one of the building blocks of the zodiac, um, contain one active and one passive element. So earth is dry and cold, water is, you know, wet and cold, et cetera. Now, from these, four, from these, you get the four seasons. So summer is going from the hot to the dry. Fall is going from the dry to the cold. Winter is going from the cold to the wet. And spring is going from the wet to the hot. This is where uh, the zodiac uh, comes in. So we're getting now to some actual astrology. Um, the zodiac can be conceived as a circle, as a unity. It's the ecliptic, it's the path the sun takes um, in the sky and the planets all stay within that band. Um, so we can think of it as a totality um, or unity as represented by the number one. Uh, it's a circle, but that circle can be, be divided by two, three, or four, um, which are the other numbers we looked at. So by dividing by two, you're getting the designation of masculine and feminine signs. Um, and then the zodiac really is the four seasons, each season having a beginning, middle, and end. So where do the ideas of what the zodiac signs, um, you know, where does that come from? And that comes from what I like to think of as the pulse of life. So this is an old map and you can see a sine wave um, on this map. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not, but this, this sine wave is the path that the sun takes uh, over the course of a year. Uh, at the highest part here is the Tropic of Cancer, which is the longest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and then at the, this bottom part is the Tropic of Capricorn, the, the shortest day of the year. And at these two equinox points is the first day of spring and, and the first day of fall. So the sun, as it moves through this sine wave, um, is giving us um, the zodiac. So the four um, signs that are the middle of each of the four seasons um, are Taurus, Scorpio, Leo, and Aquarius, uh, whose zodiacal signs are the bull, eagle, lion, and angel. And so this is a painting from uh, the poet Raphael, um, the vision of Ezekiel, which happened to include um, these four. Um, in modern astrology books, these four signs are called the power signs because the sun is comfortably sitting in the middle of each of the four seasons. He's not initiated, the sun is not initiating a new season, like in the cardinal signs, and he's not changing seasons, like in the mutable signs. He, these are the, 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 the court, quarter cross signs. Um, so the middle of, of spring, fall, summer, and winter. I just think this is an evocative image. Um, you can also, you know, 12 signs. Um, I, I like to think of them as uh, in terms of opposites. Um, You've got the Aries Libra axis, uh, the Taurus Scorpio axis, and these are very broad, um, somewhat simplistic or simplified um, ways of looking at the signs. But the signs provide the backdrop uh, where the planet, where the planets, um, can take uh, action and, and do things. Uh, of course, the Moon is the um, sister of the sun or the partner of the sun. Um, in traditional astrology, the moon was the most important planet because the moon had the most to do with the here and the now. One, because she was mostly closely associated with materiality, but two, because of her, the swiftness of motion, um, what she was separating from and applying to in terms of other planets had very much to do with what is being conveyed or what is happening right now. So for example, if I, um, you know, wanted to do a chart for the beginning of this presentation as a traditional astrologer, and by that I mean astrology practiced before, um, up until the 17th century, if you had to look at one planet, uh, the moon would be the one that you would you would look at. Um, you can see here here uh, her eight phases, um, which obviously take place every month. That's where we get the word month from the moon. 
And here you can see the sun and moon as partners and an image of the sun and moon uh, archi in architecture. So here on the right um, in Washington, DC, you are seeing visually a representation of what of the sun and the moon. Um, in addition to the sun and moon, there are five starry planets, as I mentioned. Each one of these planets was thought to govern uh, an area of um, reality, I guess is one way to, to put it. Um, and were ordered um, with the Earth in the in the middle. This is the Ptolemaic um, view. Um, Copernicus, you know, came along and used, being proven with Kepler's laws, um, a heliocentric universe. Um, understanding that the Sun is the center of our solar system uh, doesn't change astrology in any way, um, but uh, it's important to. Um, understand just seeing this visually uh, in terms of the different sort of levels that these planets um, govern experiences. Um, this is a more modern way of looking at the planets and the, the specific areas that they have dominion over uh, within our psychologies or in our lives. Um, again, these are very, um, uh, I don't think they're incorrect. Um, and I think that hopefully any random astrology book uh, you pick up um, would should have some some sort of variations on these um, in sort of bringing these um, planets to life. And here they are ordered. I, this is what I meant to say in the previous slide. They're ordered um, based on their speed. So you always start with the moon coming from the place of position of Earth You're and going outward. You start with the moon, then Mercury, Venus, et cetera, with Saturn being the slowest um, and most distant um, planet that takes almost uh, 30 years to complete a, a revolution. You can look at these seven domains of experience in, I was trying to think of a, something that everyone or most people might know, um, the characters of Star Wars are very blatant, um, when I thought about it, very blatant um, characters that could be understood astrologically. Um, the place where Luke Skywalker comes from, his home planet and his aunt and uncle are very much involved with the moon. They are the uh, foundation uh, by which he he comes about. Uh, the droids, um, C-3PO literally says, or his character, I speak, you know, 10,000 languages or 100,000 languages, whatever he says, that you cannot have a more mercurial um, <laughs> statement than that. Um, Princess Leia, I, I put as Venus here because it's Luke's attraction to, and he is drawn towards Leia is what gets the, the hero's journey started. It's his, he is drawn towards wanting to help Princess Leia and comments on that she's so beautiful. In that capacity, she is, she's a Venus character. Uh, Luke is obviously the son. He is the hero of the story. Han Solo, who takes action, um, is very action-oriented, um, could be considered Mars. Obi-Wan Kenobi, who teaches Luke about the Force and gives meaning, essentially, to his life and purpose, uh, could be considered a Jupiter character, and Darth Vader um, as Saturn. Um, so... Uh, this is my astrological chart on the right. Um, on the left is a picture of the solar system. Um, and just to sort of give a visual of, of what the solar system uh, actually looks like and then how an astrologer um, takes that or, or what an astrologer is using um, uh, juxtaposed uh, next to each other. So an astrological chart, as you can see, is a two-dimensional image. Um, and... Um, this is a blueprint in time. This was the moment I was born in 1977, um, August 29th at 11.37 in the morning. Um, and what astrology posits is that from an energetic perspective or, or from, uh, that's how I look at it, um, I carry this moment of time in how I, how I vibrate, how I, uh, my being. Um, it's, it's, it's my style, uh, my way of being. Um, as considered as a, a slice of, of time. Now astrologers can take that slice and extrapolate it out over time using a variety of techniques. I say here, astrologers sim symbolically extrapolate meaning through observation of the cycles and planets against the backdrop of the zodiac. So here's just a, a visual um, of what uh, astrologers can do um, in order to understand where people are in their cycles. Um, like I said, astrology is not fortune telling. Astrology is not going to tell you you're going to break your leg next week. <clears throat> but if you get a good dialogue um, with someone and can understand where they are in their life or what specific issues they're dealing with or what astrologers can access information 
um, and whether it's in the form of a recommendation or question or dialogue, um, help people understand uh, what time it is uh, in their lives. So now we're going to get into self-development. There are three areas I think astrology can help with. One is uh, contextual understanding, what, kind of what I was just talking about, understanding uh, who one is and, and where they are. Um, astrology can help with integration and also with purpose. So here's a quote from Latsu, um, Know Thyself, um, or I'm calling this slide, Know Thyself. Um, he says, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character becomes your destiny. So what he's describing here in terms of these little thoughts that then over time turn into your whole life or what he's calling your destiny. Astrology is a way of looking at what one's uh, orientation um, or sort of natural predisposition is in that way. And so in theory, um, to becoming more conscious of, of who you are, of who one is, um, you can actually be allowed a, a greater degree of free will uh, and freedom because you're acting um, through uh, sort of enlightened self-awareness. Um, fate is obviously very real. I believe that when people do not uh, understand themselves um, as well as they could, that's when you're actually more subject uh, to fate than, than otherwise. So the four paths, <clears throat> excuse me, that I think astrology can help with in this regard is, is studying the self through one's own birth chart, um, studying the birth chart of others and understanding really how other people are different than, than you are, or I'm sure we obviously all know all our family members and friends and partners or whomever, they're clearly different than we are, see things differently, communicate differently, react to things differently, or care about different things. And just by learning and, and studying how uh, those around you uh, are different from how you are, you gain a greater appreciation not only of them, but of yourself. Um, learning the system, um, by the, that's what we were looking at today a little bit. Um, even if you don't, there's no way for, for you as a person that astrology could, could ever work. Just learning what it was um, in the system itself is extremely, in my opinion, extremely interesting. Um, and is valuable in and of itself, getting putting the details aside or whether it's it's real, so to speak. Um, and then lastly, the the most um, uh, the most um, the best part of learning astrology for me is understanding that truly that uh, not only are we in the universe, but the universe is is inside us. Um, we are um, expressions of of, of the universe. Um, and that's something um, that uh, is in the form of contemplation and reflection, uh, very re rewarding. Uh, and in my opinion, very um, uh, healing. The second main way astrology can help is uh, through integration. Uh, the word to be integrated comes from what we were looking at before, integers, an integer, a whole number. <laughs> um, so going back to numbers. Um, and the goal of having an astrological chart as a person is to make that chart work, to give everything in the chart um, a way to express itself and to make all the different parts uh, work with each other. Um, that's involved somewhat with the concept of aspects, which are the geometric relationships of the planets with each other, uh, which form essentially complexes in us, um, or our complexes are can be reflected in, in the set of uh, in aspects. And by working to integrate these different parts of ourselves, um, we can be uh, more whole. Uh, the work we typically think of individuals, I'm an individual, I'm, I'm different than you are, I'm, I'm my own person, but individual means indivisible. Um, and oftentimes, um, all of us, we're humans, um, become uh, disjointed. And I think astrology can be a, a help to bring back um, integration. Uh, here's another quote from Jung, life calls not perf for perfection, but for completeness. And I think astrology can help people understand who they are um, uh, and the positive and negative qualities about themselves, as opposed to who we want to be um, necessarily, or um, it's, a, it's a way to come to a greater, more realistic, more sober um, sense of, of self. Lastly, um, this is kind of a complicated looking slide. Let's look on the left side. Uh, Aristotle had the idea of four causes, and these are the four things that are brought up to make to, for something to come into existence into being. It needed four things. Um, 
the material. So looking at the table on the left, the material cause is the wood that goes into the table. The formal cause is the design or the idea of the table. The efficient cause is the carpentry, the skill and work that go into building the table. And then there's the final cause. The final cause is what is the what is the purpose of the table? And in this case, let's say it's for dining. Now, modern science is extremely good. On the, looking at the right, um, you can see um, we know a lot about uh, the material ca cause and the cells and molecules that go into our being. Um, the formal cause, I would say, is, is to some extent um, our, our DNA. Um, the efficient cause is, is cell reproduction here. And then this, I got this from the internet, I'm not sure what, but the, the final cause apparently of being a human is to move around and move the body around. Um, I think astrology can help uh, because you can see, one can study and see themselves as a moment of time of the universe ever constantly changing. Um, you can get an understanding of that your um, purpose, your destiny, which is a destination, is to become yourself. That is the goal. Um, that is one way to look at uh, if, if you have a goal in life, um, it's to become you. Um, and I believe astrology can help people, if properly understood and practiced, can help people do that. It can, as I mentioned on the first slide, it can create a lot of confusion and um, people can develop incorrect beliefs about themselves, which are actually harmful, but that's uh, for another story. So in conclusion, I've got two quotes here. The first is from St. Paul in Corinthians. He says, there's one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for one star differs from another star in glory. So that kind of speaks to what I was just talking about, that we're all we're all special in our own ways. Uh, and then the second is from Carl Sagan, the, the famous uh, uh, scientist of the 20th century. The cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Um, now, this is this slide is a little bit um, subversive in the sense that I'm not uh, attempting to uh, say that uh, either Paul or Carl Sagan were fans of astrology. Carl Sagan wrote a book uh, that he's openly not into astrology. Um, I think that's unfortunate because, um, well, don't have time to get into that, but um, I still think these are two beautiful quotes. Um, these are books that I would highly recommend um, for different levels of understanding people may have, or, um, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions at any point about if people would like to learn more. Um, but these are all books that are, um, in my opinion, very high quality. And that's it. Um, and that's my website, translatinglight.com. Thank you.